Okay, everybody, your final lesson for key period eight is going to be on the 1970s, known as the stagnant 70s. And um, we're gonna get straight to it. We're gonna be starting off looking at kind of the political side of the 1970s. And there is a lot of scandal and something called that stagflation, which I'll talk about that in just a little bit. But we're gonna be looking at the economic and political problems known as the malaise, kind of this, this uh, period where everything's just kind of stuck in a rut. And so we're gonna be seeing how that is going to have influences socially, politically, and economically now, as well as down the line. So first thing is, hopefully you have your president's chart ready. If you have your president's chart ready, you can pause this video and get this information about Lyndon B. Johnson and his administration. But I'm gonna go ahead and get right started. So in 1968, um, Bobby Kennedy has really kind of captured the nation's imagination, this hope that we could actually have another pre uh, uh, Kennedy presidential, uh, presidential administration. We lost the opportunity for a second, uh, a second administration with JFK. We were hoping for bringing that back with Bobby. He had won the California Democratic primary. So he had won the primary here in California. And basically, if you win California, you are well on your way to becoming the Democratic nominee as well as potentially being the, the winning candidate. People loved Bobby Kennedy. However, a crazed man who was um, unfortunately sur suffering from uh, delusions, a man by the name of Sirhan Sirhan, walked up to Bobby Kennedy as he was leaving the hotel that he had given his, um, his speech of acceptance for the California Democratic primary, and he shot him right there in the kitchen. And uh, Bobby Kennedy died shortly thereafterwards, and um, the fact that we lost both Kennedys was devastating to the American public. But above that, it was also devastating to the Democratic prim uh, Party who had lost their primary candidate. And so they are gonna need to quickly find somebody to fill his place. And that man would be the vice president, Hubert Humphrey. Hubert Humphrey was vice president, so yes, he has experience, but he was kind of this very bland kind of figure. And so because of that, the American public was not super jazzed about him. He did run on a platform of getting out of Vietnam, but he just wasn't one of those motivating figures. On the flip side, we had another vice president who was going to run, and that was going to be Richard Nixon. Here we see Richard Nixon talking to Nikita Khrushchev in Russia during something called the, um, the Kitchen Debates, in which Russia had built this um, or had invited Americans to build the quote-unquote typical American home so that Russians could see what it was like. In this debate, Vice President uh, Richard Nixon had been telling uh, Nikita Khrushchev, look at what capitalism is possible to have, that we are able to have all these wonderful things that make our lives easier. To which Nikita Khrushchev says, ah, but in communism, the people are hardworking. They don't need these silly little devices because our people understand the value of hard work. To which um, Richard Nixon said, yes, but these allow you so much free time that allows you to invent all kinds of other things that are time-saving devices and that make your country stronger. Things like, oh, I don't know, the light bulbs that are making this room actually visible, as well as the television cameras that are videotaping this entire conversation. So his strong stance against communism, as well as his promise that he would get out of Vietnam, makes him a very likely candidate. He runs also, though, on promoting a group that he calls the silent majority. The silent majority were those people that did not agree with the anti-war protests, the people that were not in favor of all of these very fast social uh, changes, things like the counterculture movement and how fast the civil rights movement was going and things like this. These were people that were feeling like they were being shouted out and drowned out by the very loud people on the far left and the far right. They considered themselves moderates, but they were ignored. And so he said, you are ignored no more. The silent majority will be silent no more. But we also have a third candidate, something we don't usually get. 
And that candidate is going to be coming from the South. He is going to be running on the American Independent ticket. Um, and, and that man is going to be George Wallace. George Wallace had been the governor of Alabama. He was the guy who had been in charge during um, – uh, the Montgomery March uh, and uh, uh, the uh, Selma March. And uh, he is going to run as a segregationist, that he is on an anti-civil rights agenda, that he is going to roll back things like the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This is the same man who has the famous phrase of segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. Um, he actually wins a a relatively significant part of the vote. As we can see in this uh, electoral map here, he was actually able to win several southern states. This is known as the Solid South, which had always voted Democrat, but they moved away from the Democratic Party because the Democratic Party was starting to identify much more with groups like civil rights activists. Um, that we had seen, you know, uh, the social net of uh, the the security net of FDR and uh, the New Deal, as well as the Great Society under LBJ, those are things that were starting to become an issue for the Democrats of the South. And so we see that this is going to be an ongoing issue that they are going to move further and further away from the Democratic Party. And so, as you can tell from the uh, political party map here, we see that the Republican Party is going to win and Richard Nixon will enter office. Now, Nixon is going to, once he gets into office, try to calm down some of the issues of the Cold War. We have something called detente. Detente is a lessening of tensions between the United States, China, and the Soviet Union. This was suggested by the uh, National Security Advisor, a man by the name of Henry Kissinger. And Henry Kissinger is um, going to be very influential in formulating our, uh, our actions against the Soviet Union and other communist nations. He believes that if we get the Chinese to sit down with us and to be on our side when we negotiate with the Russians, that that is gonna be the strongest thing because those are two communist nations, but if we get China on our side as, look, we don't want to nuke you, you don't want to nuke us, so let's just kind of agree to disagree, that that was going to be good overall. And it does improve relations for nearly a decade. And so um, this is going to allow for us to push forward into a new era with the Soviet Union. Now, the Soviet Union also has a new leader. His name is Leonid Brezhnev. And Brezhnev is going to be involved in the SALT talks. The SALT treaty stands for a Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. This is signed in uh, 1969. And what this does is it um, agrees that we will reduce our nuclear arms, um, us in the Soviet Union, and this is hopefully going to take us back away from that policy of brinkmanship and release some of this fear of nuclear war. However, although things start to go better politically, economically, things are starting to fall apart. And we see the beginning of something called stagflation. Stagflation is a combination of the words stagnation and inflation. So what makes this quote unquote stagflation? Well, it has to do with um, issues of what we are producing as well as the actual price of things. The problem is, is that our economy was starting to stagnate. We were not making as much as we used to. Remember, we shifted from a blue collar society to a white collar society in the 1950s. So that means that we have less manufacturing jobs and our economy is going to be based on service industry. That's harder to pin down prices and also values for. So that's problem one. Problem number two is that we also have, because of this, um, this shift in uh, the style of um, manufacturing, we are gonna rely on other things to try and balance out the economy. So we have an increase in spending, things like um, the Great Society, spending on defense in Vietnam, 
but we weren't increasing taxes that much, which meant the federal government didn't have a lot of money in order to help balance out the economy if things started to turn sour. We see that manufacturing and GDP starts to go down, which leads to, um, to there being less job available. So we have higher unemployment. We also see that companies are starting to make less money. But typically when that happens, we see a recession, that prices remain low. But prices actually remained high. Why? Because of international competition. Because we were competing with other nations, we were trying to make ends meet um, by having higher prices because although they had um, uh, a product that was cheaper, we figured ours was of higher quality so we could charge a higher price. Unfortunately, what that does though is that people have lost their jobs or have reduced hours so they're not making as much money so they cannot afford these inflated prices. And so um, Nixon, in an attempt to solve the problem, takes the U.S. off the gold standard. The dollar that you have in your pocket is not based on the gold standard. It is based on a promise from the U.S. government that that dollar is actually worth something. And so, while this does allow the federal government to decide how much money is going to be in the system, that they can put more money in, take more money out in an easier way than if we were on the gold standard. But the problem is, is that that means that our money is, and its value is based on essentially people's faith in the economy. And as people started losing more and more jobs and inflation started to continue to rise, people had less and less faith in the economy and thus we continued this stagnancy. The election of 1972 is quite momentous, partially because that there is a woman who is running for president, and that is Shirley Chisholm. And she almost gets the Democratic nomination, but the fact that she is a woman and the fact that she is black is going to tell a lot of people or make them think that she is quote unquote unelectable. So who do they nominate? George McGovern, a congressman from South Dakota. And he's going to run on this idea that he's this political outsider. He's not going to play the political games and so on and so forth. Um, but you have to remember, he's from South Dakota. He's from a state that's only one electoral vote more important than Wyoming. So he doesn't have a large base to actually have to, to start off from. Who is he running against? The current president from California, the most populous state in the nation, Richard Nixon. So Richard Nixon is going to be running on what he calls the Southern Strategy. The Southern Strategy was appealing to conservative white Southerners who were against the Civil Rights Movement. They had traditionally voted Democratic, so much so that they were called the quote-unquote Solid South. But he promised to be tough on crime, which was kind of his way of saying, anyone who is breaking local Jim Crow laws, I'm going to make sure that they get arrested. So he was going to essentially walk back a lot of the civil rights movement. And thus, he was able to break up the Solid South. And we see that in the biggest electoral landslide in American history, that he won every single state except one, Massachusetts, and he lost Washington, D.C. He won all but 17 electoral votes. It is the largest sweep in American history. He had a massive popular vote. And so the American public was very much behind Richard Nixon. He was almost guaranteed a win from day one against George McGovern. However, as soon as he comes into office, there is almost an immediate problem, and that is going to be the oil embargo. There were two wars that happened at the very end of his first administration, the Six Day War and the Yom Kippur War. These do not happen on American soil. Both of these are going to happen in Israel and around the area of Israel. Now the issue here was that the United States had backed uh, Israel during both of these wars that were um, uh, propagated by Soviet-backed uh, Arab nations, Syria and Egypt. And in both of these, Israel had won with a pretty decisive victory. 
And so because of this, these Arab nations um, who were uh, part of an organization called the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, also known as OPEC, placed an oil embargo on the United States. They did this because they were trying to get back at us for backing Israel. So what does America do when suddenly our oil supply has been cut significantly? First thing is, there is going to be a, um, a greater emphasis on creating and completing an Alaska pipeline. That we did have oil, we had found oil in Alaska, and we wanted to be able to pump it directly from Alaska to, uh, to the United States, the, the contiguous United States, Alaska's part of the U.S., um, but the contiguous United States, so that we could have oil faster and thus make it cheaper for Americans. We also instituted a national speed limit, and it was called the Drive 55 program, that the, that the ultimate speed limit in America on America's highways was going to be 55 miles per hour. They saw that as reducing speeds and thus reducing oil consumption, which was hopefully going to de help deal with this overall oil crisis. But in the meantime, we had to limit people's uh, ability to get oil and specifically gasoline and so people were limited to 10 gallons of gas per customer and you could only go on certain days so if your license plate started with either an odd number or an odd letter so a c e or odd letters then you would be able to go and get gas only on odd numbered days of the month and the same and the opposite would be uh, applicable to those that had even numbers and even letters. And so the idea was that this was going to reduce the problem of um, the reduction of oil in America. The issue though was that it created these massively long lines, people waiting in, um, waiting in line for hours in order to get gasoline and many times that these gas stations would actually run out of gasoline before people actually got to the pump. And so um, we had created this society that was obsessed with their cars, a society that had um, always prided itself on how big and awesome and loud our cars were, that we were the nation of the muscle car, but we couldn't keep them running because we didn't have any gasoline. And so this is going to lead to a greater focus on MPG as a, um, as a push for why people buy a certain car. They want a car that has good gas mileage. And American cars, with being made of heavy American steel, just wasn't going to cut it. And so we're going to start to turn towards imported cars, cars from Korea, cars from Japan. Why have they been able to create these better cars? because the United States had been protecting them for so many years um, that they didn't have to worry about foreign protection and putting emphasis on their military, that they got to put all of their emphasis on domestic things like inventing lighter and more fuel efficient cars. And so this is when you start to suddenly see that there are fewer Fords on the road and there is an increase in things like Toyotas and Hyundais. Now, despite the fact that Nixon was virtually guaranteed a win in 1972, we end up having the Watergate scandal. So what happens? Well, there was a break-in at the Democratic National Committee's headquarters, um, McGovern's headquarters, that was at the Watergate Hotel in Washington, D.C. And um, essentially that this break-in was designed so that they could plant bugs um, so that they could listen in on the plans of the Democratic National Committee. It was found out, and the, the group that was responsible for this is the appropriately named Committee to Re-elect the President, also known as CREEP. And so this is going to start to be investigated as to who had these people um, go and investigate or who had these people go and bug uh, the DNC, who was responsible for, um, for the plan in the first place, and so on and so forth. And the men that begin to um, investigate this are going to be these two gentlemen. Um, these guys, uh, Woodward and Bernstein, wrote for the Washington Post. Uh, 
And although they were pretty much told not to, that it was um, a non-story, they felt that there was something more going on. And through their investigative journalism, they were able to determine that this was something that was not um, a, a small event and that the men that had been arrested for the crime were actually paid by people much higher up. However, despite the fact that there is all of this evidence that seems to be going back to the White House, the bugging case and Nixon's previous fund scandals, that um, Nixon still comes forward as being uh, supportive of ensuring that this is being investigated. And he actually says um, that you must pursue this investigation of Watergate, even if it leads to the president. I'm innocent. You got to believe I'm innocent. If you don't, take my job. And so what we start to see is people start to question things going on and that um, more and more people that are getting closer and closer and closer to the president are being implicated in this particular event. In fact, it starts to go so high up that we start to find that there is an actual cover-up by Nixon and the White House on this particular issue. And most of Nixon's cabinet is going to be implicated in this, including his vice president, a man by the name of Spiro Agnew. All of them are going to resign because they are unable to continue in their positions because of how much damning evidence there is against them in the initial conspiracy and also the uh, eventual cover-up of this. Then it comes to light that there are recordings of President, uh, President Nixon's conversations about this. President Nixon was super paranoid and he recorded everything. And so there were these supposed recordings of him having conversations with these cabinet members about the cover-up. He is asked to turn these over to the intelligence committee and he refuses because he says that there is presidential privilege and this is, is going to go against and uh, threaten national security. This leads us to something that has never happened before, that we sue our own pre uh, pre uh, president, not principal, president. And this is the case of U.S. v. Nixon, that Nixon was required by the Supreme Court to hand over the tapes, that, um, that this uh, taping was not included under presidential privilege. However, when he passed them over, there was this very mysterious, suspicious, 18 minute long blank spot on the tapes. Now, later on, his secretary, a woman by the name of Rosemary, um, said that she must have accidentally recorded over a section when she was uh, rewinding the tapes. However, the evidence kind of made it seem very suspicious. Um, and so this led to people assuming that Nixon had erased information to prevent him from being directly implicated in the cover-up. And so because of this, he was essentially forced to resign because otherwise he would have been impeached and he would have been found guilty and thus removed from office anyway. So he left on his own terms in 1974, the first and only president to ever do that. Nixon, however, as you can see from all of these cartoons, was going to be heavily criticized by the political cartoonist Herb Block, better known as Herb Block. And so all the cartoons that you've seen flashing by through all of this were all drawn by Herb Block as criticism of Richard Nixon and the Watergate scandal. So with your political party chart out, you are now going to be able to get the information about Richard Nixon's administration. So feel free to pause the video to get that information down. So when the president, uh, well, typically leaves office, but in this particular case resigns from office, who is going to take over but the vice president? The vice president was a man by the name of Gerald Ford, and I'll talk more about him in just a moment. But one of the interesting things that does happen during Gerald Ford's administration is America's bicentennial on July 4th, 1976. And there was a major focus on traditional values, the renewal of America and kind of a rebirth of America's values.
largely due to the uh, scandal that erupted as a result of the Nixon administration. Gerald Ford isn't known for much, so I'm already putting up his president's chart stuff now. So Gerald Ford um, is known as Mr. Nice Guy. He was known as a very kind of congenial character. And that was part of the reason why after the resignation of Spiro Agnew as a result of the Watergate um, uh, scandal, Nixon brought in someone who could balance out this idea of the, the, the bad and kind of um, scandalous side of his administration. He wanted someone who was nice and well-liked. So he brings in Gerald Ford. But when Richard Nixon leaves office, Gerald Ford now becomes president. He is the only president to have ever come into office that was not directly elected by the people in any way. And so under this uh, new position, he's going to do two things. One, on his basically first day in office, he is going to pardon Richard Nixon of any crimes that he might have committed. The reason that he does this is because he wants to protect America from the division that will just inevitably come from continuing to discuss the issue. So he's like, we need to get over it and we need to move on. And so he pardons Nixon so it ends the conversation. That makes him very unpopular but by a lot of people, though, that they feel that Nixon should have had to face his crimes. The other issue that Gerald Ford has to face is the fact that inflation continues to rise and there seems to be no ending of it. And so he starts a program called WIN, Whip Inflation Now. And it was a failure, so I'm going to move on. So, in 1976, Gerald Ford is going to run for re-election and fail in that. Um, he is going to be running against the man you see in the picture here, and that is Jimmy Carter. Um, fun fact, he is the only president to have ever run actually using a nickname, not his given name. Um, although Richard Nixon often went by the nickname of Dick, he did not run with that nickname um, in his political uh uh, campaigns. But we do see that with Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter is very much going to be the antithesis of everything that Nixon was. He was the Republican, or excuse me, the Washington outsider. That he is going to say, hey, I'm not like the rest of them. I'm not going to play that political game. I'm not going to play the you scratch my back, I scratch yours. And so um, during this period of time, People are really disillusioned with the government and disillusioned with these traditional politicians. The problem is, is that everybody else that's in Washington is the typical politician. And so he really struggles to get along with these individuals and to get stuff done. He comes into conflict with Congress every single day. But one thing that he does have kind of going for him is that as a devout Christian, he aims to bring morality back to politics. And so people knew that there were not going to be any scandals under his administration. And that was one area where people at least felt safer. However, his administration is going to have a lot more changes than just the fact that he is this outsider and somebody trying to bring morality back to politics. First of all, he had, previously to becoming president, have been a peanut farmer. And so um, people are going to see him as this, um, kind of similar to Ford, this very congenial character, this very nice guy, and in many cases are going to kind of not give him the benefit of the doubt that they would other political figures. Um, but he's very successful. First of all, he creates um, a new department, the Department of Energy. He also creates the Department of Education, wanting to make sure that Americans are having regulated energy, which was one of the problems that we were having at that time, nuclear energy and um, the, the oil crisis, but also education, which was becoming a contentious issue because of things like school prayer and desegregation, etc. He also is going to try and fight inflation by having tax cuts. More people having more money in their pocket will allow them to buy items at higher prices. He also pardons the Vietnam draft dodgers. The war was over, and he wanted those people that had dodged the draft 
to either be able to release from prison or to be able to return back to the United States if they had escaped to places like Canada or Mexico. This was very unpopular among a lot of people, especially those who had had family members fight and die in Vietnam. But he felt that it was important for America to admit that Vietnam was a mistake and by pardoning these draft dodgers that he was acknowledging the fact that they were trying to get out of a war that was unfair and unjust. He was a massive human rights activist and would very much support the issues of the civil rights movement and the other movements that were happening at the time, including the feminist movement, as they were fighting for the Equal Rights Amendment. He is also going to try and fight inflation by deregulating transportation. By getting rid of some of those transportation uh, requirements, he was going to hopefully create more competition, which would lead to better prices, which would lead to hopefully the creation of more jobs because companies are going to be getting more people buying their things. So this was a hope that he would have. Unfortunately, his biggest problem is going to have to do with this issue of energy. And that was at Three Mile Island. There was a partial meltdown of the nuclear power plant at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. Three Mile Island um, was one of America's nuclear power plants. It was a place where we were producing a lot of power for the United States, especially for that eastern seaboard. Um, it was the worst in the U.S. Uh, in U.S. history, the worst meltdown in uh, U.S. history. However, Carter reacted very quickly. Um, he not only created an investigative committee to figure out what went wrong, but also to prevent another accident like this from happening. And Carter, which is a surprise to a lot of people, um, prior to become a peanut farmer, he had actually been a nuclear scientist. When he was in the Navy, he had been a nuclear scientist and he understood how these plants worked and so when they were talking to him about trying to find ways to come up with solutions to the problem he was able to actually contribute to those conversations and understand what needed to be done the problem though is that the accident had already happened that nuclear uh, vapor had already been released into the atmosphere and people freaked out and so because of this it prompts protests across the nation demands for clean energy and demands for the end of the use of nuclear energy. Now, while Carter could not seem to get along with Congress, one thing that he tended to overall be successful with was foreign affairs and dealing with other nations. And one of his greatest successes was with the Camp David Accords. President Carter invited the leaders of Egypt and Israel a Jewish nation and an Arab nation who had been at war with each other pretty much consistently for the last 20 years to come to a conference at Camp David, the presidential retreat. And he basically sat them down in a room and persuaded them to sign a peace accord. And this was the very first peace accord that existed between these two nations. And it was absolutely legendary. Um, unfortunately, it wouldn't last forever. But it was a first major step in trying to solve these problems that were causing America to have to get involved in these foreign conflicts. And so he was really hoping that this would be long lasting. He also is going to sign the Panama Canal Treaty. In this, he vowed to give full control of the Panama Canal to Panama by the year 2000. And when this happened, the American public was kind of angry because they felt that they were going to lose a lot of money from this, which they did. The U.S. would have essentially free passage through the Panama Canal because, you know, we built it. But he figured this is, this is imperialism still. We are holding on to territory in this foreign nation that truly should belong to them. And so as kind of this humanitarian act, he gave it back to them. He also is going to have action against the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. The Soviets invaded Afghanistan to try and create a communist nation. The problem with this is that Afghanistan is a very religious country and communism doesn't really allow for religion because it divides people culturally into classes. And so 
um, there was rebellion. And we are actually going to support the people who are rebelling. And it is this group called the Mujahideen. And I'll talk more about them in a future lesson. But also as a sign of our, our displeasure with the Soviet Union invading Afghanistan, we boycott the upcoming Olympics, which is in Moscow in 1980. And so because we boycotted the Olympics as well as withheld grain shipments to Moscow, the very next Olympics, which was the Summer Olympics here in Los Angeles in 1984, was boycotted by the Russians. And so we see that um, while he's trying to stand up, stand up for humanitarian issues and standing up for the little guy around the world, it doesn't necessarily always play well politically here at home. But the worst issue that he has to deal with as far as foreign influence and his biggest failure has to do with the country of Iran. America had deposed a democratically elected nationalist premier, so a man by the name of Mohammad Mossadi, who um, had seized British oil properties in the 1950s. And um, we didn't want him because he was a nationalist, essentially saying, you know, put Iran first, don't trust outsiders, don't trust the West. And he was also trying to institute more religious uh, conservatism in his country. And so because of this, um, we had removed him and placed a um, secular leader, a man by the name of Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, as the leader of uh, Iran. And that is, uh, his position is called the Shah. However, the Shah would end up being deposed by the people of Iran. So we have a lot of people being deposed from power. And that was because they did not like this American-backed guy that was um, that was westernizing and was um, making more liberal choices than the people actually wanted. When this happened, the Shah, who actually was quite ill, um, asked to come to the United States to get cancer treatment. Carter allowed for this deposed Shah to come to the United States to get this treatment. There were riots in Iran as a result of this because they felt that we were either allowing this guy to escape to the United States and not face the, um, the facts of his being deposed and um, the crimes that he had supposedly committed, but also that, um, that they felt that the United States was going to secretly try and replace this guy or put, place this guy back in charge. And so because of this, this riot that occurred, 52 Americans were taken hostage by Islamic militants after they took over the American embassy in Tehran, Iran. And they were held hostage for 444 days. This whole riot um, was supported by a man by the name of Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini. And Khomeini was uh, then essentially placed as the leader of Iran as a religious leader, essentially turning the country of Iran into a theocracy. And we tried to negotiate, we tried to make deals, and we even tried to rescue them several times. However, it failed. And so um, these finally uh, would be solved, this issue would finally be solved after number one, um, the Shah that we had allowed to come to the United States died of cancer. And so there was really no reason to hold these hostages anymore because the threat of him coming back was no longer an issue. As well as the fact that Iraq, kind of helping the United States out a little bit, um, invaded Iran. So Iran had bigger issues to deal with than just the United States. However, to punish Carter for, um, for being involved in these uh, attempted rescue missions, uh, to punish him for, um, for trying to uh, negotiate rather than, um, than do whatever he could to release these prisoners. Um, they demanded that, uh, uh, Republicans demanded that when the hostages were released, that they would not be released until the end of Carter's administration. And so Carter lost the next election 
and Ronald Reagan is going to win. And so the hostages were released only minutes after Ronald Reagan was sworn into office. Essentially, they were like, did he make the oath? Okay, cool. Okay, release the people. And so um, Reagan gets the credit for the release of the hostages. However, it was done through the negotiation of the Carter administration. And um, we see these stories, um, uh, this story being very well um, told in the movie Argo, that actually was a movie about a fake movie that was being used as a way to sneak some of these hostages out of the country. Um, it's a fabulous movie. I highly recommend you watch it. Or if nothing else, um, watch 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 the uh, you know watch the trailer for it to get an idea of how this went down. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of Jimmy Carter's administration. Um, and so, if you want to get this, you can pause the video and get the information on Jimmy Carter. While I could spend a ton of time on this, it's not really a big focus on the uh, exam. So I'm going to go through it very quickly, but we're going to talk about the culture of the 1970s. And really what we're going to see is that it is kind of a microcosm of the greater political uh, events and also economic events that are happening at the time, as well as a continuation of many of the social issues that we saw from the 1960s. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, this group is called the Me Generation. That is the nickname given to those baby boomers that came of age in the 1970s. So they might have been born as baby boomers and officially baby boomers, but they came of age in a very different time. This group of people is, tends to be more indulgent and self-involved. And that is because they lived in an era in the 1960s where they were growing up in economic prosperity. In the 1960s and 70s, we have a disillusionment with traditional authority because of things like the Vietnam War and because of, um, uh, because of things like Watergate, the Pentagon Papers, etc. We also have a lack of social movements. Essentially, the civil rights movement had died down, the AIM had died down, uh, the United Farm Workers were not really that active. Uh, the feminist movement was going on, but that was about it. And so there really weren't a lot of major social movements like we saw in the 1960s. Also, those unifying social leaders, Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy, had died in the late 1960s. And so we didn't have those unifying leaders like we had previously. They are going to be focusing on things like self-realization and self-fulfillment. Exactly what makes me happy, not necessarily worrying about the long run, not worrying about society as a whole, not worrying about their duty as an American, but what makes me personally happy. And so because of this, we see that uh, marriage rates drop, divorce rates soar, and birth rates drop. So we have fewer people in this generation than we saw in other generations as well, that we don't have as many babies being born. So major events in the news. We have the Apollo 13 mission, which the fabulous movie starring Tom Hanks is all about, where we were attempting to go to the moon and we almost didn't make it. And these guys um, almost died in space and the entire nation and world was anxiously waiting to see if they would make it back home safely, which thankfully they did. We see that in the 1970s, Walt Disney has actually expanded outside of California and opened Walt Disney World in a giant set of acreage of swampland in the middle of nowhere of uh, Florida, but very quickly becomes a massive tourist attraction on the East Coast and um, becomes a massive um, uh, moneymaker for the Disney franchise. We see that Hank Aaron breaks Babe Ruth's home run record. And we also see the first, well, quote unquote, test tube baby, which is essentially the very first IVF, in vitro fertilization. Um, and people were afraid that we were playing God, that if somebody was, you know, barren, that that was the way God intended it. But this was an amazing uh, forward movement of science. We also saw some interesting other things like the Jonestown suicides. The man that you see here, um, his name, 
is Jim Jones. And Jim Jones uh, created a cult that was uh, called the People's Temple Agricultural Project. And this uh, cult was located in Guyana, which is um, uh, interesting that we, we kind of focus on this in American history, considering it wasn't taking place in the United States. But most of the followers were American. And so he got all these people to believe that there was um, like a, an essentially a, um, uh, a second coming and that they needed to be prepared for it and that they wanted to um, uh, be able to go to heaven directly. And so he convinced them to drink cyanide-laced Kool-Aid. And so 900 of these members committed suicide by drinking this Kool-Aid that was laced with cyanide. And so when you hear people say, don't drink the Kool-Aid, um, or somebody's drinking the Kool-Aid, what they're referring to is the Jonestown suicides, that they are referring to these people who fell under this guy's kind of hypnotic uh, uh, personality and uh, weren't thinking about the consequences of what they were doing. We also are going to see the kidnapping of Patty Hearst, the granddaughter of William Randolph Hearst. She was kidnapped and indoctrinated by the Symbionese Liberation Army, which was a very radical left-wing um, militant group that was trying to, and this, this sounds so off, they were trying to bring about peace, harmony, and civil rights through violence. And um, she was kidnapped and uh, reported to have been brainwashed as she participated in, um, uh, in actual like bank robberies. And um, later on said that, you know, once she was released that she uh, didn't know what she was doing, that she had been threatened and beaten and assaulted to, to agree and to follow whatever uh, the SLA had in, uh, instructed her to do. We also had a massive blackout in 1977 in New York City. It was hot, the lights went out, and unfortunately there were massive, massive uh, amounts of looting, arson, and crime. And so you can see here people just running wild, stealing all kinds of stuff, um, breaking buildings, breaking windows, etc. We also see a shift in health, spiritu spirituality, and exercise, part of this me generation. Health foods become popular. We actually get the very first uh, food pyramid during this period of time telling us what foods we should and should not eat. And so we're very focused on, you know, eating healthy. You know, there's this idea like, you know, oh, you want to eat granola, things like that. We also have new age spirituality. We move away from traditional religions and we move further into um, these these spirituality uh, or spiritual, I'm not even going to say religions because they're not really formulated religions. It's things like using crystals and um, um, meditation, holistic health, astrology, tarot, etc. And then we also have the exercise craze. We want to be as fit as possible. And so we have a fascination with jogging. Jogging becomes a pastime that people do in their free time for fun, which is weird because you're just not going anywhere. You're just running in a big giant circle. We also are going to have an obsession with aerobics, specifically a new thing called jazzercise, where it is exercise to jazzy music. And so it's kind of a combination between aerobics and dance, and it's just oh so fun, and there's so much spandex. And then finally, we have bodybuilding. And this is the time frame where Arnold Schwarzenegger is going to win the Miss, uh, Mr. Universe and Mr. Olympia, where he is going to become this massive bodybuilder and make a name for himself here in the United States because of bodybuilding. Next, I'm going to go through this really fast, but I highly recommend that you guys check all these things out, and I'll actually have links for them with this PowerPoint for you guys to go ahead and look at, and you can click on all these little pictures to give you more information. But television and movies are going to um, uh, be a great way for the United States to illustrate its, um, to illustrate its, its new uh, culture.
And so uh, one thing that we see is family shows, that we are trying to get back to more traditional culture. We're trying to get to more moral values and things like that. We have lots of comedies, things like Mork and Mindy, which we see up at the top, Happy Days, which is a show in the 70s, about the 1950s. Um, and we also have some dramas. But these comedies are very wholesome and they're fun. And uh, we even have one that's a musical, The Partridge Family. So um, this is kind of supposed to be throwbacks to the bygone days of a safer and more moral society. We also see that women get more prominent roles, that we see shows that have women as the lead characters, Charlie's Angels, Wonder Woman, as well as one of my personal favorites, The Mary Tyler Moore Show. And why that one was so particularly important is because it showed a single working woman. And that was something that was just not done in previous decades. We also see that they are tackling political and social issues. The show MASH, one of the greatest shows to ever be on television, was about the Korean War, but it wasn't really. It was set in the Korean War, but it was very much a way of speaking about the Vietnam War. And in fact, the show went on for more than double the length of the Korean War itself. And so um, the characters were, were iconic of many of the issues that were happening in Vietnam, much more than the issues that occurred in Korea. And um, its finale still holds the record as the show that had the highest percentage of television viewership for any television finale ever. To give you an idea, it beat out the Super Bowl. So that gives you an idea. We also have a show called All in the Family. And the main character in this is a man by the name of Archie Bunker. He is a professional malcontent. He is constantly pissed off at something. And he's also this kind of old man who's stuck in the rut and doesn't want to live in the new age. He likes how things used to be. He wants to go back to the good old days. And you see his, you know, his daughter and son-in-law and how they're trying to bring him into the modern age and how he's just this old curmudgeon. But what's interesting is that in that show, despite the fact that, I mean, he says things that would not be shown on television today, it was designed at the time to be social commentary about people who were unwilling to get with the times and the people that weren't accepting of things like civil rights and weren't accepting of things like feminism. And a great example of this in the show is that there is a black family that moves in next door. And oh my gosh, Archie Bunker is just like, well, there goes the neighborhood. And he's like, there's nothing good that's going to come from this. And yet, the man that he now lives next to is a man by the name of George Jefferson. And this guy is a black man, and he hates white people just as much as Archie Bunker hates black people. And they end up finding out that they have more in common than they have apart because the two of them are both just crotchety old men who are angry at everybody. But what that show ended up doing is that George Jefferson, who was just there as a neighbor and kind of this side character, became so popular that they actually got their own shows. And it's rev uh, kind of revolutionary in seeing that we see more racial diversity on television. Shows like Good Times and Welcome Back Cotter had multi-ethnic groups. Welcome Back Cotter had not only a black character, but an Italian character and a Jewish character, which was just unseen on television prior to this. And finally, we have more dramatic and esoteric films that we are going to be seeing. Um, and we're going to be looking more specifically at the movies here in just one second. So with these movies, we have lots and lots of different films that are going to come out at this time that reflect a lot of various issues. That we have, for example, socio, uh, social stories like the movie Roots, where we're telling America's history, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We also make fun of those various same issues in movies like Blazing Saddles, which is a fabulous movie. I highly recommend it. It's super inappropriate. Um, and for that time was super revolutionary because it was the story of a black sheriff who was taking care of a Western town. And yes, they make the same jokes that you would expect them to make in a really bad movie. They also have um, movies that are flashbacks to a previous era like Greece, 
that we see movies that are all about the American underdog because we see ourselves that way in the Cold War. And in fact, Rocky is later on going to fight the Russians in a symbolic gesture of the Cold War. We also are going to have um, movies that are going to be these esoteric films, these films where they are going to be pushing boundaries as the 1970s were trying to do. And a great example of this is the Rocky Horror Picture Show, a movie that is going to um, introduce us to a fabulous actor by the name of um, Tim Curry. And it is about these aliens from outer space. And the leader of this troop of aliens is a cross-dressing man. And that was so outside of the traditional social norms in America, totally pushing boundaries. Also, we are going to see that we are going to see the introduction of um, one of America's most important um, uh, directors, and that is going to be Steven Spielberg. When it comes to music, we are going to see that music is no longer used like it was in the 1960s and the 50s as a social message. It's now just meant to enjoy it. And so we see all these different iterations of rock. Rock music starts to split into a whole bunch of different types of genres. You have pop and pop rock. So popular music was starting to meld with rock and roll. And so we created this new style of rock that was a little too happy-go-lucky for traditional rock and roll. It didn't have any message. It didn't have any storyline. It was just, you know, happy music, but it was rock music. We also start to have, um, and so that would be example like the Jackson 5. So you would see them as an example of pop or pop rock. We also are starting to see things like hard rock. Um, hard rock was rock and roll that had a bit of a harder element to it. And so an example of this would be something like Journey. We also start to see punk rock. So we see that with the Sex Pistols. Punk rock was built out of disillusionment in Britain, came here to the United States, and became kind of the favorite of, it became, a favorite of those that felt like they were um, not seen and not recognized in American society as well. Then we have um, a great one called glam rock. Glam rock is uh, where it is glamorous rock. And so we are going to see groups like ABBA as well as uh, one of my personal favorites, Queen, where they're going to take um, – uh, rock and roll and they're they're gonna make it fancy it's gonna be theatrical it's gonna be lights it's gonna be fire it's gonna be costumes and makeup kiss is a great example of glam rock um, David Bowie a great example of glam rock we also start seeing disco ABBA as well as people like Donna Summer are going to introduce this new and very well loved or very much hated style of music we also get the introduction of funk Funk is going to be made popular by James Brown. And this is um, taking R&B and it's taking traditional Motown sound and it's giving it a little bit more funk. And so it's going to be a new style of music that's predominant in the African-American community. We have Southern rock, which is going to mix rock and roll and traditional country Western music. This is going to be made very popular by groups like Leonard Skinner and um, uh, Willie Nelson, the Eagles, etc. And then finally, the very beginnings of hip hop and rap. Hip hop and rap is going to just be in its very earliest stages in the late 1970s. And, um, and we're going to see it really come into its own in the 1980s. All of these things, though, are elements of 1970s culture that are um, going to illustrate a me generation, a focus on the self and self-realization and, and things that make people personally happy, not focusing on larger issues. And that is going to be a problem because as we get into the 1980s, we can't ignore those problems anymore and they are going to fall upon us like a stack of dominoes. So we'll start talking about that starting on Wednesday. I'll see you guys then.